I'd like to talk about the idea of teacher voice. Specifically, we're going to try to answer the question, how can we as teachers and educators in general use our voices to elevate the profession? Uh, teacher voice is one of those big ideas that's been thrown around a lot in education, but um, unlike those other big ideas, I don't think teacher voice has been given a lot of kudos or props. Today, I seek to change that. So the first thing I'd like to say is I had a ton of people come to me and, and tell me that teacher voice is just one of those things that we really uh, have to have a debate about. Uh, but the positive notes about teacher voice were the following. They wanted a voice that was nuanced, distinguished, and powerful. So the first big image I thought about was the idea of a lion. Uh, most of you know that a lion's voice can travel about uh, five miles at 114 decibels. But it isn't so much about its pitch or its volume. It's about how, um, how loud, well, not just how loud, but really more about how deep it gets. And we really want to have that voice because at the end of the day, we want our voice to get attention, just like a lion's does. And we need it to be powerful enough not to yell, specifically at kids, because we shouldn't be yelling too much. But it's more about speaking up and speaking out about the things that are happening in the classroom. So the first big word I'm going to be using, uh, props to my science folks, is the word bioluminescence, which is the production and emission of light by a living organism. Uh, it's when a pigment and an enzyme come together, and when they clash, they make a glow that you often see with fireflies, squids, and glowworms. Uh, Chris something, you know I got that right. So thank you. Um, and so as you're thinking about this, I want you to think about the following. Humans think it's beautiful to see this, but really it's necessary for their survival. It's necessary for these creatures' survival, and in dark times, this is the way that they alight themselves in order to feed, and it's a great analogy for what's happening in education now. Uh, let me continue. I really don't know anybody who knows how to glow but just by sheer will. Well, except the guy behind me. And, um, and even then, his voice provided the foundation by which he was able to project images and sceneries within our minds in order to uh, talk about the ideas that he was saying in his songs. So he can glow as much as he wanted to. And it's near impossible for the rest of us to glow, but the one thing I know is that the way we're going to invest in our voices matters in a huge way. Now, a little bit about me and my dreaded teacher data report. Ooh. Um, the NYC Department of Education on February 24th, 2012, decided to release the thousands of third through eighth grade English and math teacher scores uh, throughout the city, including my own. When I first found out about it, I was a little rattled, I'll admit, I lost a little sleep. And it wasn't so much because I thought it was an a valid score. It's because I wondered how students would react when they saw it. I wonder how parents would react when they saw it. I wonder how many of you would react when you saw it. Um, I kept thinking about it because at the end of the day, my resume speaks for itself. I felt that the students who had gone on to college and still love math were a, a reflection of me. The people who uh, still salute me on the street when they see me, including parents, uh, and the teachers who I still work with, and frankly, the many of you who continue to comment on my blogs, thank you so much, uh, and be able to, to provide me that kind of support and that feedback that I so really desired. But in the interest of transparency, let's talk about the reports. So from 2009 to 2010, I was given a score of seven with a margin of error of 25. So <laughs> I could have either been the worst teacher in the city or one of the worst teachers in the city. <laughs> from 2007 to 2010, I was given a score of 39 with a margin of error of 41. So I could have been an above average teacher or a below average teacher. We have no idea. Now, they had 118 students for my register when I clearly had over 160 during that time period. Um, and then it led me to think about a couple of questions. Number one, um, does this even matter, frankly? Number two, how's this, how does this help me grow as a professional? I mean, it, and if it does at all. Because if it really does, then am I supposed to teach to the test now? Is that really where my focus is going to be? Um, third, it made me wonder, how would students react? How would you react now that you know my score? Um, what am I supposed to say now? And lastly, was it the intention of Joel Klein and Michael Bloomberg all along to have this happen when they first created the reports? But they published my report anyway.
All these names that you see behind me, um, they published my report, great. The first one, the New York Times, decided to give teachers voice by having us fill in an online forum to tell us, um, to tell the whole world that these scores uh, are not really what they're about. But if we're talking about that score, then in fact we are validating that score instead of actually saying that it's completely erroneous. Fair enough. Um, one of the journalists that actually spoke to my colleague, Ariel Sachs, decided to say, well, the media, of course, we had to, when we, once we took it, we had to publish it. To which she said, um, no, you didn't. You didn't have to publish them at all. Um, as a matter of fact, the Freedom of Information Act might have given you the data itself and given you the chance to look at it, but it didn't give you the foresight to think about what to do with it. Now, um, the last yellow rag that you see there, uh, the notorious NYP, um, they decided that they were going to tell us who the best and worst teachers were based on these reports. Now, um, if you're going to go ahead and hunt down parents and teachers for a story, then I don't know what the value is in reporting about these scores. If you know that the scores are erroneous, misleading, um, incomplete, and outrageously undermining, then why would you do it? Actually, you know, I'll give them props, fair enough. I'm not saying that they do not have to hold down the scores. They, they could have published them all they wanted it. Actually, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm, <laughs> what I'm more saying is, <laughs> what I'm more saying is I, they shouldn't have published them. Frankly, half the people who came into the profession with me, half, more than half, nationwide, as well as in the city, have left already. And they didn't leave because of the kids. They left because of the high stakes conditions that were placed upon them and the, um, the deleterious uh, te teacher conditions, as well as the administrative faults that have uh, plagued us all. Because you see, it doesn't just affect teachers, it affects principals. It affects students, it affects parents, it affects all of us. Well, it seems to me, except for the people who are at the upper echelon of our governments currently. So what do you say to a young teacher? Specifically, what do you say to that guy in his second year who knew a little bit about how to teach kids but didn't know much about creating a bulletin board? Now, if you know anything about me, me and bulletin boards do not get along. <laughs> but the one thing I knew is I knew how to teach kids. And you know, what could have been a teachable moment between that administrator and me became a series of unfortunate events that resulted in me almost getting a U rating just because I didn't please the administrator's aesthetic. Now, I don't know about you, but that's not the profession I want. Um, and then furthermore, it made me think, what do we need to do to advance my voice? And at the end of that, that year, I said to myself, I would never let anyone take my voice away from me as long as I knew that student issues come in front of adult issues. Now, thank you. Um, one of my big inspirations for my teacher voice is Rakim, who's the greatest rapper of all time. Don't tell anybody from Brooklyn I said that, though. Um, in, the, in 1992's hit, Don't Sweat the Technique, he writes, they want to know how many rhymes have I ripped and rep, but researchers never found all the pieces yet. Scientists try to solve the context. Philosophers are wondering what's next. Pieces are took to labs to observe them. They didn't absorb them. They couldn't observe them. My ideas are only for the audience ears. For my opponents, it might take years. Pencils and pens are swords. Let us put together from a key to chord. I'm also a sculpture, born with structure. Because of my culture, I'm a rip instructor. Difficult styles that'll be for the technology. Complete sights and new heights after I get deep. You don't have to speak, just seek and peep the technique. All right, so I'm jamming on, I'm jamming on my iPod and I'm on the A train. I'm like, oh, this is cool. And then I said, oh, snap, I got it. Oh, wait, Ted Tech. Oh, it was, it was a great, great song. Um, so one thing he had was this balance between emotion and reason. He has this calm resolve, not just in the song, but in his entire discography. Two, he has an expert confidence, and he won't let any hater take away that, that respect that he's gained over the years. And number three, he always keeps his audience in mind, so he likes to keep it real. It keeps him grounded. So. Rather than get jaded, I got active. I started to create platforms online. I started connecting with many of you that are in the audience. I also started creating um, 
relationships offline, including becoming uh, a director for the Center for Teaching Quality. It was awesome, and it continues to be so. But more importantly, I became a harder worker for the kids. And many of the titles that you see in back of me, thank you, uh, it's more important for me to become an advocate for students. And I didn't do this to students. I did this with students and for students. And that's critical for me. Now, you don't have to be this guy. Um, and, and again, this is SOS March if you, you haven't seen it before. But one of the things we know is I am not a bubble you can erase. I am not a bee you can eat. Um, I am a heat you cannot beat. <laughs> you hear that, Michelle Ree? You can't do that to me. So, <laughs> all right. But I'd like to leave you with three examples of really good teacher voice with the time that I have left. You can be Renee Moore, excellent classroom teacher, who in front of the ESEA re reauthorization panel decided to protest and talk about the shortcomings of the No Child Left Behind Act. Speaking of which, so are we going to wait 10 more years to say that the race to the top isn't going to work either? Is that our intention? I should hope not. Um, we can be Frank McCourt who, again, excellent classroom teacher, spoke in front of my college alma mater and said that he wanted to go from fear to freedom and release himself of the dogma that, I, that has constantly plagued him throughout his life. Or you can be Martha Infante, excellent classroom teacher, who talks about what an honor it is that her students feel and, and trust in her to keep them accountable as well as trust them with their lives, not just academically, but socioeconomically as well. So I propose this definition, teacher voice, the collective and individual expression of meaningful professional opinion based on classroom experience and expertise. And it comes with three characteristics. Number one, we have to balance it between emotion and reason. These are our two chemicals from bioluminescence, remember? So also, we have to have an expert confidence, not just in our content, but our pedagogy. And number three, we always keep our students in mind now because the students are the audience. And it also comes with three caveats. Number one, we are already students first. Teachers are student advocates. So if that's the case, then we already put students first. So why do we need an organization called Students First? It also begs the question that if we want students to have an excellent education given the limited resources we already get, why do we need an organization called Educators for Excellence? Thank you. Um, second caveat is that we know that conditions for teaching are conditions for learning and vice versa. If we know that we can affect one thing, we immediately affect the other. These two are not separate issues. This is not teachers' rights versus students' rights, Kenneth Cole. So third, and most importantly, we want to see it at the table. We don't just want to be at the end of the after uh, coffee conversation. We don't want to be after dessert. We will actually want to sit at the table in front of the meal. And oftentimes, we want to make that meal as well. All this to say, we need to light up, ladies and gentlemen, and quickly. Right now, uh, we have a lot of people who believe that uh, teachers need to have advocates everywhere else. And it's really nice to have allies, believe you me. However, if we're going to have a professional organization, and we're going to have a professional profession, we need to ensure that we are ourselves advocates for our own profession. Um, also, I, I love this, um, also worth saying is that teachers right now are under fire for asking good questions, for integrating social justice into their talks, for uh, differentiating and making sure that every student really gets all the services they need. But more importantly, they're talking about what best goes for the students, not just academically, but socioeconomically as well. And all this to say, we need to light up now, ladies and gentlemen. We need to illuminate. We need to, get a, we need to turn that fire in its head. Let's do that now. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much.